the United States is still, still, still winning. Japan second, but look China. China is now number three, right? It's almost the same number like Japan. China is going to bypass Japan very, very soon as the second most innovative nation in biotechnology then. Now, if you compare the, what I would call the old world, which is the G7 world, Japan, Germany, United States. So this is 1981 and this is uh, 2019. You see that the peak is over or over. You see there is still in USA and in, in Japan a kind of small angle of growth. In Germany, actually, and in Europe, we are declining. Look at China. Look at China. And I could also show you Korea, etc., etc. So I think this is showing where the major innovation biotechnology sector power will be coming, uh, coming, uh, coming years. Again, not over 100 years. It's happening now as we speak. Then. So what about India? I did some study and I came across uh, the DBT National Biotechnology Development Strategy. And uh, it shows that in 2025, which is only two years from now, the uh, volume of the uh, biotechnology industry in India is expected to have a market size of 150 billion of US dollars. This is not small, and of course this is going to grow. So India is definitely positioning itself in this uh, important, uh, important growth and in the biggest movers and shakers scientific innovation markets in this context. So uh, I'm here representing a basic bottom-up science global organization. So let me just quickly share with you some of my ideas about how the innovation cycle works, right? So what is the journey from the basic discovery science to the new applications? So I think we are still living in the world of the incremental innovation. Right? So we are investing in education, etc., science, research, and we do it both basic and applied, and it takes from decades to centuries, and then innovation comes. So this is the 99% of the innovation cycle we are doing. There is, however, yet another innovation which is disruptive. Somebody comes with something quickly, for example, graphene, almost overnight, and then it takes over and it goes very, very fast. I mean, if you look at the information technology about all these things we are having all the time in our pockets, this is a disruptive innovation, which happened in a very short time and which is now governing basically not only the world, but also our mind in this context. And then <coughs> there is a high risk, high gain science where you are welcoming to the new outrageous, crazy ideas, which may not be clear uh, clearly promising any applications, but which, when trusted, can develop, can end it in a disruptive innovation. So these three categories, and I'm today uh, standing here for those last two. I will show you what I mean by that. So about uh, incremental innovation, you know, over centuries, this is how it looks like usually. So for example, you see here the transport from 1850 to 2050. You see here the air transport. You see here the surface tramp communication, etc., etc. So this is the way how the world is progressing. Long-term, consistent investment and producing it. This is an example of... Uh, no. Okay of a disruptive innovation. I like this picture very much because it shows you the uh, Easter Parade, Fifth Avenue, uh, in 1900, right? You see? Horses overall. Only 13 years ago, right? It was always count. So isn't it disruptive innovation? This is what's happening not overnight, but over 10 years. So something, things can happen extremely fast. <clears throat> the pace of technology change is rapidly increasing, you know that? So, um, so, for example, we all are, at least my generation is coming from these times, 
I got my first uh, punch card machine uh, in 1980, and uh, you remember all the frustrations, all of that we have been doing. And of course now I'm having this stick in my pocket and more, and I can put on it uh, almost whole computer program, which et cetera, et cetera. So again, this goes very fast, and actually even this is now outdated. We are all on cloud, I guess. I'm doing cloud computing on my road in the taxi here, and it's just amazing how this goes quickly in this context. Uh, of course, it is also important that sometimes the high risk, high gain basic science needs time. It, it doesn't happen overnight. So this is the very nice uh, history of the mRNA vaccine, which probably you know, was first uh, studied and discovered actually in uh, the 60s. And it took uh, consistent additional investment still in a not promising ideas. I mean, even before COVID, nobody was really thinking about mRNA vaccine right now. So that idea came across quickly, but the investment has been made uh, over the years consistently. Then. So there is an international organization, which I am very proud to uh, lead, which is called Human Frontier Science Program. It was established uh, due to the geopolitical ground. In 1987, Japan was looked at by United States as a huge competitor, a problem, adopting technologies, producing everything much, much faster and even better. And it was a situation, the Prime Minister Nakasone of Japan, who is here, he uh, wanted to break through this, this, this perception of the reality, whatever it was, and he proposed to the G7 leaders, you see here uh, Ronald Reagan, you see President Mitterrand, all of them were there, Margaret Thatcher, very big history. He proposed to, um, um, uh, create an international organization which will be harnessing uh, the best minds across the world in the life science for the benefit of humankind, meaning uh, not just for Japan. Japan made a huge endowment at the time, 1.8 billion US dollars to support it, and the, all the G7 countries and European Commission agreed to establish it. So this is what it does, it is looking across the world for the most innovative, outrageous ideas, which are coming to us like 4,000 a year. And it does a uh, very special way of selecting the best of the best, about 4%. And then it's um, supporting uh, this in a very special way without any red, red tape. In no geotagging, it's international, it is transdisciplinary. It is putting the idea first and uh, it shows uh, this high risk, high gain nature because we are supposed to um, excel, but you can fail without any consequences because high risk means uh, high gain or not. To me, when I came to organization in, uh, in uh, July 2021, I'm still trying to believe this is possible because it became tremendous success by all possible measures you can think of, academic measures, 28 Nobel Prizes, which um, are attributed to the projects and uh, grants we have been supporting. Yet another four Nobel Prizes, which were given to our Nakasson awardee, awardees. All other prizes you can think of here are part of it. Publications cited about uh, three, five times more than, uh, than we uh, than, than average all of that. That's the academic side. But what I found most interesting, every three years, there is an independent review, which is looking about, uh, across the world, about patents, the innovation patents deposited in the large field of uh, biotechnology, biopharma, material science. And surprisingly, projects which came to us out of curiosity, which do not pretend any applications in mind, they are cited by these patents about three times more than emission-driven top-down science. I think this is a testimonial to supporting a creative free mind of people. Of course, in our case, this is not only one. We have a three disciplines together. We do require the best of the best. We do require international collaboration. But I think it's still very interesting this is happening. So I can lead you very quickly 
you know, before I show this picture, what it means. India is the major member. India joined the organization in 2006. It is Department of uh, Technology, DBT, representing India in this program. Um, uh, India contributed so far about 17 million U United States dollars and uh, it got back in the disbursement in international projects a little bit more, so this is good. But the most important, you know, India has extremely competitive edge. So the blue one is the uh, research grants and the other one is frontier fellowships. And just imagine, this is a 4% of the world best. And every year there is an Indian winner, which means that there is an enormous quality here, which I think we have, which can compete with the rest of the world. This year, we just finished the um, um, selection cycle. Out of the 800 initial applications for the Frontier Fellowship, we selected after a very heavy round of selections 52, and six goes to Indian Fellows. I think this is the testimonial for, for, for quality. I'm here also to tell that, um, of course, so far we were, we were perceived only as a life science, we are much more. I talk about horizontal biology, about convergence, so I'm also here to invite you to connect to us. In uh, New Delhi, I visited uh, not only DBT, but also DST and Minister of Earth Sciences to broaden up the mandate, and I think that from here, there could be a lot of, lot of interest in connecting to us as a potential fellows or the potential, potential projects. So, uh, of course, this is not about uh, numbers and money, this is about Indian people, this is about projects. So very quick review of some of the Indian excellence in this program. Rana Matam Sudhami, she was uh, leading the research grant with Denmark, United States, and she discovered a uh, new treatment in the biological function of the meiosis. We have uh, someone who won three times grant, which is almost impossible. He was director of the, uh, of the Bangalore in CBS study. Um, there is a nano, GNA nanostructure project, which is uh, supportive for Raul Roy. We have uh, fellows, uh, the recent one is here in 2013, showing um, uh, collaboration with the Princeton, for example, and it's in CBS, uh, the one which is um, um, on the Anjana Badrinarian, she studied um, repair mechanism in the cell and many others. Then. So just quickly to show you something, I will be very quick. This project came to us and uh, that was about, uh, about Dorsophila, fruit fly, and it was about, the uh, question was about um, what is the basic biology of developing brain you know, this, in these flies. It turned to become a uh, project which discovered the SHG gene, which then got the basis of the, one of the most successful uh, medicine patented in drug in the United States and in uh, EU with the markets of billions. This is one of the most successful treatment uh, in oncological system. Then. So, brain of the, of, the, of, the, of the fruit fly was the initial idea. It became actually the important medicine then. Uh, this is um, Gentech. You know Gentech, Avi Fregev is our grantee and is our uh, Nakasone awardee. Uh, she was actually the one who was at the beginning of the single sequencing, single cell sequencing. She developed the technology. It was commercialized and Gentech is based largely on our alumni and grantees uh, history, which is also a very interesting uh, story of success. Um, this is a project where uh, the uh, engineers and electronic engineers and the biologists came together and used the uh, biomechanics to actually teach the robots to run and to walk. So the most advanced uh, robotic uh, uh, moving uh, systems are based on a fusion between the uh, living system and uh, engineering. Uh, this one I like very much. <laughs> uh, people came to us and they wanted to have a project to understand how this uh, fascinating animal gecko 
how do they stick to the ceiling and to the, to the, to the, to the wall without any application in mind, that project developed one of the most important uh, adhesive material in the aircraft industry. Boeing and Airbus are using the adhesive developing this project. So just realize, right, a couple of crazy guys, Gecko, nobody would fund it, right? DBT wouldn't fund it because what the heck, the Gecko. But, you know, just give them chance, right? Ch nourish the, the free mind and they will come with a result. I think it's fascinating then. Uh, we'll go a bit further. This is, the, again, the fa fascinating uh, biorobotics. We have a projects which are looking into the uh, beetle and there are, there are scarabia and again developing the, the uh, robots which are now being used, for example, in Turkey and Syria because they can walk there where no, no people, no dogs can come actually to find other people. This is one of the most interesting uh, applications. Again, it's about beetle, but you have, a, you have a beetle which you can actually you now move there and they, I think they can help you when you, when you, when you create a bio beetle in this context. Another project is um, about um, the, how human brain and system responds to the magnetic field, how this geomagnetic sensory works and what kind of neurophysiological um, consequences and systems are involved in it. And it's also connected to that, for example, treatment of Alzheimer nowadays, this results. Yet another example is uh, the flying, uh, flying robots. So uh, this is uh, similar like the beetle. Um, we have a system where uh, the uh, flies and the insects um, can get an antenna. And uh, for example, used to go to the places which may be toxic before any human being can come back with the information. Um, this is again the salamander bodies, and this is something Prabhat and I discuss a lot because he was one of the pioneers of the artificial limb. This is artificial bio limb, complete fusion between uh, a uh, mechanics and, uh, and bio uh, functioning of the body system. Again, this is all coming from a completely unbound bottom up scientific thinking. Yeah. Um, so, we are now moving into the future. This fascinating, um, what I call it, uh, program in organization is really beautiful. I, and it's every day such a joy to work with these beautiful minds across the world. They are beautiful minds. They are so crazy as uh, John Nash. Have you seen Beautiful Mind movie? Tell me the, the, the book about John Nash. So th these people are like that. They are crazy, they are creative. We've got about 8,000 people across the world who are part of our system. So in our system, you get a grant. And when you are finished, then you uh, are a member of the community. So we keep contact with them. Uh, so we are now moving into the next century. The strategy plan being, is being approved as we speak. We have a major meeting in Paris coming June. Uh, we are growing and um, we are getting more members. South Africa is joined last month as an example then. But to me, um, there, is a, there is a more to it. You know, G7 world is of course a world which governed this world, this earth, in the 90s, but not anymore, right? I mean, there is excellence and power and economic power, brain power everywhere. Look at India. So I would like actually to move with this program for the next five years into the really global program. I would like to see countries like India, like South Africa, like um, the others uh, from the global south, Brazil, Argentina, Mexico, to actually g being given a chance to sort of profit from this fantastic creature equally. So to me, the inclusiveness and the equality is very, very important. So I came here to India, not only to organize a number of workshops at Bangalore and, and, and here in Hyderabad and everything, I came here also to talk to the government. I met the minister, I met the secretaries, I met the Dr. Sut, the chief science advisor of the Prime Minister Modi. I met the G20 Sherpa, Mr. Khan, and I was telling them the same story. I said, look, this beauty, 
which really needs to be there because this century will be driven on biology. It's a, it's a global good. I need a champion, I need a country which will help me to bring this to the really global organization. So I came here to invite India to sort of show and demonstrate the global geoscience technology leadership. I asked them to bring us to the G20, which they will do. And from that point on the Indian leadership to Brazil G20, hoping that uh, within the next five years, we will have a much more equal, much more inclusive frontier science organization. So this is also my invitation and hope to you that you will share with me this hope and this, this, this plea to actually be more inclusive and to help us a little bit in this context. But of course, for the leadership, you need a vision, right? You cannot lead without vision. So I like this uh, picture by, uh, by Seneca who said, if one doesn't know to which port one is sailing, no wind is favorable, right? That's, that's, that's a simple truth in this context, so we need a vision. And you know, in my view, we are still living in the Renaissance vision. The Newtonian physics, plus a little bit of the Einstein, but not really. And this is what is the current... Newtonian physics doesn't talk about life science. It doesn't talk about humans. It doesn't talk about beetles. So I believe we are at the verge of a uh, major, major breakthrough, which will be putting to this world a new vision. I call it the Anthropocene vision. Maybe the book which will be coming out of it, or paper, will be called Terrestrias Rationals Principia instead of Philosophic Naturalis. And who, who knows, maybe some of these brilliant students in the room here I spoke this afternoon would be here. Maybe over 20 years, somebody will be standing here and showing this picture with um, some of you there. So please mount your mind on this. I think we have a, we have a, we have a chance to change the world, to think about integrative, inclusive thinking, where the life and humans are integral part of the system. And uh, believe with us, like we believe that the greatest innovation and creativity lie beyond the reach of experience. So don't do more of the same. Open your mind, discover, take a risk, show courage. And I think this is what makes, in the end, a life uh, worth of living. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now the session is open for question and answer, but due to time constraints, we'll stick to two to three questions. Thank you. Dr. Somebody is okay. Okay. Do you have a Maybe you have a microphone, we could, we could get the others profit from your intervention. Thank you. <coughs> yeah, this was a very eye-opening uh, presentation. Thank you very much. So one of the questions that I have for you, you showed one of the slides, I think it was the second one, where you showed that China has gone from being where it was the seventh place to almost the third place. Um, can you elaborate more what was the reason that China has gotten there? Is it the, the political side of the spectrum that is driving that? Or is it some other needs that define the innovation? What has China done to be so successful in this particular field, but in many other fields? I think, uh, this is my personal analysis, I think China was uh, able to revert brain drain cycle. If you look at the, uh, for example, the whole California environment, if you look at the Silicon Valley, right? And if you look at it over the last 30 years, then you see, if you look at the Harvard, if you look at the Stanford, or the MIT, many, many Chinese diaspora came there, and they stayed there. They stayed there for 10, 15, 20 years. But if you look at the situation over the last 10 years, 15 years, they are coming back. Most of them are coming back 
into the fascinating laboratories, fascinating positions in Shanghai, in Beijing, etc., etc. So I think China really didn't develop much on their own, but they were, they were able to get back, basically, the brains which were sent out, which got fertilized, and uh, they are now leading edge of the uh, of discussion. So I think it's in the uh, brain circulation, brain drain, is my personal opinion. Then. That problem we, sorry, about problem we, we still don't have solved in many other countries. I mean, I don't know about India much, but I think in the other countries there is still a huge, huge uh, one, 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 one direction traffic. So that's, that's yeah. I, I just wanted to add a comment to this. So what China did was very systematically, they created one program in which they're giving 5,000 fellowship every year, and they were sending researchers to global labs where everything was paid by China. For two years they could stay, but for completing their PhD they had to come back to China. So out of that 5,000, maybe 2,000 went back, but 3,000 stayed back. So very systematically they worked this out. This has been going on for the last 20 years. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. There is an organ organic kind of system which is collaborating all the time. Yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Very nice presentation. One of the slides it shows this oncology is coming down or mental disease going up. Oncology, is there any research or how it says it, oncology? Because it's very trendy right now. Well, I think if I remember the oncologist coming down, it was only somewhere after 2050. So it's partly wishful thinking maybe, I don't know. But of course, um, this is a scenario analysis which is trying to uh, chart some path into the future. And uh, of course, we do, we, do, we do believe that at some point in the future, we will be able to uh, tackle the uh, uh, cell uh, uh, reproduction by very fundamental discoveries, and it's already, you know, partly happening, of course. So um, I cannot substantiate exactly if, if, if the trend, which is now still upward, will go down in the next 10 years or 15 years, but probably at some point in the future it will. Then, yeah. Then. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I would like to request BC sir to please uh, felicitate AP Agarwal sir. Thank you. I'd like Suzanne to please offer the word of thanks. Good evening, distinguished guests, teachers, and students. I feel very fortunate to be a part of this immensely efficacious event. On behalf of everyone who's a part of Dr. D.Y. Patil International University, I, Suzanne Mandel, consider it my honor and privilege to extend the vote of thanks. We are extremely grateful to Professor Pavel Kabad for acceding to be here today and for his incredibly impelling lecture. Um, uh, the part where Professor Kabad machines and its elucidation really stuck out to me. Also, it was very interesting to learn about South Asian countries' display of prowess in biotechnological innovation. Professor Kabad's comments about the redundancy of the conventional innovation model also really spoke to me. Um, and I particularly liked when Professor Kabat mentioned about the disruptive innovation model and how it is incorporated in HFSPO. Lastly, the fundamental researches undertaken at HFSPO uh, were extremely impressive and enlightening. Uh, thank you very much for the talk, sir. And uh, And my sincerest thanks to our respected Vice Chancellor, Professor Prabhat Ranjan, for enabling this lecture and for being a perpetual facilitator for the university's students to participate in lectures and talks as exceptional as this. Thank you, sir.
Further, we are very grateful to the university's management for making all the arrangements for, the, for today and for enabling this lecture and interaction. I would be failing to fulfill my duty if I did not thank my fellow student volunteers for their hard work and assistance, assistance throughout the event. Thank you, my mates. One last time, I'd like to express my appreciation to everyone who worked on the event. Thank you, everyone, uh, for taking your time out to be here today. Uh, may you have a very pleasant day ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Suzanne. If there are any further questions or queries regarding the question, you may please head over to the seminar hall. Professor Kabat uh, will accede to interacting with the students soon. Thank you.